can do is, uh, okay, it says that we are live. So now, uh, go back a screen. That's so weird, does it think? Let's oh. click on the blue. I'm sorry, the play button. Hey, there we go. Hello. Well, that's not a good sign. Oh, there you are. I wonder if the Wi-Fi here is just not good enough to uh, manage both. No, there you are. Okay. A little delay. Wait, it says no viewers. Like There's no viewers. I didn't say no viewers. It's just slow. Yeah. Hello out there. If you, anyone's watching yet, we're going to wait a minute or two to get started. Google Hangouts is currently telling me there are zero viewers out there. So I am going to activate the Q&A tab and I will ask you, actually I can open the chat window and I'll try to chat with you guys, see if Google's lying to me about how many of you are online yet. So I'm gonna just slowly um, touch. Three viewers, okay. Hello, all three of you who've tuned in so far, or maybe more of you. Google seems to be slow about letting us know. So I'm going to wait another minute or two until everybody rolls in. So everything is working if you're hearing my voice and seeing my face. Um, I will go into the chat room right now so those of you who showed up on time aren't penalized, and I will start chatting with you while we wait a minute or two. Oh, okay. That's fine. That's the other version of me. Oh, not me. No. Hello, Elizabeth. I saw your question. I don't know what the full story is with the chat room, but I tell you what, we have 13 viewers so far, about 55 people signed up. I bet we'll get about half that. That's a good tip for all of you people in the world out there. Whenever people sign up for something free online, usually about half the people show up, and then the other half um, of those fantastic people aren't always fully paying attention anyway. But uh, let's go ahead and get started. So thank you for tuning in. This is the live Q&A about writing memoirs and the book, uh, The Ghost of My Father, which is the memoir that I wrote that was published last year. One of the promised rewards I offered to all the backers of the book was to do this, to talk about the book and the themes from the book and answer questions about either writing books or what it was like to write a memoir. I will talk for about 10 minutes of stuff that I know I get asked all the time about memoir writing. And then I will talk to Vanessa Longacre, who's actually right here. I want to slide over. Hi. <laughs> this is Vanessa Longacre. She's a, an old friend. She's a therapist, a trained therapist. She gave feedback on early drafts of the book. So she has a unique perspective on writing memoirs, uh, the value of writing 
in terms of uh, therapeutic therapeutic value. And uh, once we get rolling with Q&A, uh, I assume some of your questions are actually going to be best answered uh, by Vanessa. So let me go ahead and I'm going to slide over here. You should see a Q&A window on your screens. Um, that's the way you can go ahead and type in a question. I know that Elizabeth asked me a question, so I know that it works, at least for her. So if you can't find a way to do it, find Elizabeth online, Elizabeth Robson online, and get her to ask your questions for you. That's the hacky way around uh, working with Google. So um, the basic question I get asked about this stuff all the time is really fundamental questions about writing, and I want to get those out of the way since they are they come up all the time. They're not specific to writing memoirs. People always are looking for tricks or tips about how do you write a book, and the answer is two things. Uh, one is habits. And that is basically the habit of writing every day. I don't think there's any secret recipe or magic trick to get around having to show up and work every day on any kind of project that's sizable, like writing a book or making a film. So you have to figure out, you have a half hour a day, 45 minutes a day, where you show up and work on writing. And even if you show up and work on writing and you don't feel like writing, you show up and spend 45 minutes staring at a blank screen anyway. And that first thing, habits, is tied to thing number two, which is about commitment. That most people say they want to write a book, they have an idea for a book, and they get started, and then they get bored, or they realize it's actually work, and they don't want to do it anymore. And they want to try to find a way around all that stuff. And I can tell you off the bat that no matter how great your idea is, or how talented you are, that you will have to be committed. Writing books is hard. There's always a point at which you realize, why am I, the hell am I doing this? Who's going to read this book? And it's something that every writer and creator deals with eventually on any project. So it's unavoidable. Two things. Habits, show up every day, whether it's 20 minutes or a half hour or more, and stare at the screen if you have to until you're suitably motivated. And second is about commitment. Now, when it comes specifically to memoir writing, there are two books that I can recommend to you. There are lots of books about memoir writing that fall into this first category. And that's just general advice about writing memoirs. And a lot of these books give you exercises and tricks and tips. And they're useful at a high level if you're not that familiar with writing, you haven't written a book before, and you're not that familiar with the form of memoirs, but yet you're sure you want to write one. So the book that I actually got value of was, out of, was this one, um, Thinking About Memoir by Abigail Thomas who's actually the daughter of one of the discoverers of DNA. Uh, not a uh, famous discoverer, I don't remember what of. And the book is simple, it's about 100 pages long. Every chapter is maybe seven or eight pages and is an exercise or question. And it's good at getting your juices flowing and getting started and trying to think about what your story is and what you wanna, what you wanna tell. But that's the easy part of, um, Great, I can see more questions now. Oh, we actually have in this, thank you, Vanessa. We're in this room that's having a few problems. I think it just doesn't like me. So the lights actually are on an auto detect system. I don't wanna bore you with the details, but if you see me run away for a second when it goes dark, I'm not afraid of you. It's just that we're trying to deal with the issues with the lights. So uh, think about memoir, I recommend it. You can find other books like it though that are these exercise-centric books and I recommend them. I recommend you pick one. But eventually, once you're out, assuming you get your habits down and you're, you're committed and you get a draft together, the thing you'll discover that's uniquely challenging about writing memoirs is how you handle time. Are you writing in the present about the past? Are you writing from the point of view that the narrator, which is you, is actually in the past? And I'm not even just talking about tense. I'm talking about how you deal with these lenses you have about you're alive in the present day. Are you thinking, of, are you going to write about how you think about your memories or what it was like to be in the memories when they happen. And this is a challenge that every kind of memoir, whether it's focused on a particular drama or it's more of an autobiography, has to deal with, and it's challenging. And the best book I found about thinking about the challenge of memoir being about managing time or your point of view in time is this book, The Art of Time and Memoir by Sven Burkitz. He's a literary critic. He's an essayist and a memoirist too. It is the best book, out of all the books I read trying to figure out how, what I wanted to do in the memoir that I wrote, it was the most transformative. It answered these fundamental questions that were, I was struggling with that I didn't realize were problems, and he offered advice, and more importantly, he offered references of other memoirs that I should read because of how they handled these problems that I was facing. And that's the third bit of advice, habits, commitment, 
The third bit of advice, and sort of this high-level chapter section of this Q&A, which isn't really Q&A yet because you haven't asked any questions yet, uh, is about um, reading what you want to write. That if you think you want to write a memoir, for whatever reason, maybe you think you want to write a novel, that means you should be reading a lot of those kinds of books. And that seems, uh, people are afraid to do that. They feel like if they do that, they'll be intimidated. Or, oh, this is so much better than what I could do. I think that's not true. That you have an idea in your head, and you may be afraid that someone else has done it, but then you go and read, you go and read a book where you think someone's done sort of what you think you're gonna do, and as you're reading it, you realize this person did it entirely differently than I did. They did some things worse, they did some things differently, and you'll learn about how to structure a memoir, you'll learn how to deal with some of the challenges you haven't even realized you're gonna have to deal with yet. So I strongly recommend that if you wanna write a memoir, you start reading them. So Art of Time and Memoir recommended memoirs I'd never heard of that are classics that are often used in literature courses. Um, stuff that's earlier than Joan Didion, stuff that's earlier than Mary McCarthy. There are references to books I hadn't heard of before, but I went and dug them up and I read them. Uh, one of the best ones that I got out of that whole series was Tobias Wolff's This Boy's Life, which I thought was the closest to the framework of storytelling and uh, dealing with narrative and time that I wanted to get to. Okay, so we're about 10 minutes in now. That's my opening bit of advice, the basics I get asked all of the time. I wanted to make sure I covered those since I know a lot of you are interested in writing yourselves. And now I wanted to switch to um, um, actually talking to Vanessa a bit because she was actually involved in the book. She's a friend that I've been with. We've been, we've been friends for a very long time. She's a close friend. And she was one of the four or five people I asked to read drafts of the book. And some of the feedback she gave me on the early drafts dramatically changed the way I thought about what I was doing. And she gave me this bit of feedback that I want to share with you before I bring her on camera to ask her a few questions. She told me that the book needed to be dirty. And she didn't mean it like that kind of dirty. She didn't mean Fifty Shades of Grey dirty. She meant something else. She meant that it had to be honest. And to be honest meant that there had to be things in the book that I probably was embarrassed by or was afraid to say, or that didn't make me look good, because that's what the truth is. And that's maybe another lesson about memoir writing, that there are these questions you have to ask yourself about what it is you want to get out of writing a book like this. Um, the, the dirty thing was that this bit of feedback that I, I thought about more than any other single sentence of feedback I got from all four or five people who gave me feedback on the book. I kept thinking, well, what does that really mean? Like, have I written this honestly? Is, is there some part of this that I would read and tell, a fr tell to a friend and then over drinks I'd tell them something else? And I, that's how I took her feedback to mean that I had to really dig in and think about um, what was, what's normally hidden in these conversations about family and how much of that I thought was important to share as part of the story. So, hold on one sec. This is a, the dramatic introduction for Vanessa. Hello. No, Hello. Okay. <laughs> All right. So, I see a few more questions are coming in now. Um, let's see. Let me just, so, okay. So, someone just mentioned, Craig just mentioned, if you, if you can't, if you've never used Google on air before, you never used a Google Hangout before, if you go to the upper left, which I think would actually be over there for you, I don't know, actually I don't even know. One of the corners, whichever the upper left corner, ah, upper right corner. If you go to the upper right corner, you'll see a little waffle iron box, a little bit of UI, that when you click on that, it'll turn the Q&A on, and you should see a panel on the right side of your screen that lists, uh, that lists your enter questions. So I apologize for not mentioning that earlier. Don't worry, I haven't gotten to any of your questions yet, so you haven't missed out on anything. Um, very good, another technical detail there, out of the way. So, uh, so Vanessa, I want you to slide over a little bit. And uh, so is, is what I just said about dirty feedback, is that what you meant? Or have I taken it to be something completely different? No, that, that, that's what I meant. That, um, Here, let's, let's do this. That's much better. There I think go. you, actually, I think you summed it up really well. I don't know that I could right. add, add more to that. And okay. I think you did a really good job of, uh, of doing that and of thinking, thinking through the... So the first question I have for you is, do you recommend that people who have family issues or are dealing with um, 
not even family issues, but even with personal issues, that they keep a journal. Is that something that's often recommended? Is that a mistake? Oh, I think I think writing, whether or not it's a journal or whether or not it's a, just, just writing about it somewhere outside of a journal, is always a useful t tool for, for people. Um, therapeutically, what they, whether or not they're going to write a memoir, or whether or not they're just trying to uh, get thoughts out of their own heads, whether or not they're using it as some sort of catharsis, or whether or not they're using it to um, be able to write a letter to a, a, a person they're having a conflict with. I think it's a very valuable So you tool. just raised something, uh, this word catharsis. Mm -hmm. So I get asked, it's got to be in the top 10 questions I get asked about the book. I get asked, was it cathartic for you? And I'm always a little annoyed when I get asked that question, in part because I don't think I know what the word means. So what does it mean? What's a catharsis? <laughs> What's a catharsis? Um, well, being able to kind of get it out, I think, okay. is, you know, is sort of the simplest version of that without going, looking up the Webster's Dictionary. Well, I don't care what Webster said. But being able to um, uh, sort of like remove it from, from trapped in, in your being, I think, is kind of how I think of it. Um, so whether or not it's your, your uh, you're going over things over and over in your head, and you really you need to you need to stop the kind of the the race of that mm -hmm. and getting it out, or whether or not it's a physical thing. You know, you might have you might feel physically in your body a, a, a tension, a stress from an emotional issue that you're struggling with, and being able to get that out in whatever way you can. You know? well, there's something definitely true about now that I know what the word means. <laughs> um, I have always kept a journal since I've been like 19 years old. And I kept it at first because it was assigned in a class to have a journal. So I used to write all these entries that would try be, it was basically me trying to get a better grade by trying to impress the professor with the things I was thinking about, which was completely bullshit. But I kept it after the class, I kept it anyway. And I've kept it now. I don't write it in every day, but it's this place you're saying physical, when I feel stressed out or something bothering me and I don't know what it is, it's this habit that I've had for its own purpose. I never intend to publish this journal. In fact, I keep it now that I'm a, I'm, a, I'm a writer, I keep it as a safe place. I know that if there's something on my mind and I need to sort it out, that I can go to this document and just put anything into it because no one's ever going to see it. I think it's important to sometimes say the things that are really dark that you wouldn't want to tell a mm -hmm. person, a loved one in your life. They, that there needs to be a place, and a journal is a great place for that, to, to say, to, to explore the, the dark feelings that you have. So keeping those private, not necessarily published is, you know, when I said dirty, I didn't mean <laughs> publish those things. I, I meant, you know. I think that you did. <laughs> I think that you did. No, you didn't. didn't. Okay, I think now is a good time to start taking some questions since that was supposed to be. We're at 15 minutes in, so I want to jump to some questions. There were some people who are already on the uh, event page. They, they posted questions already, so since they were early, I want to their, get to their questions first. So uh, Jill, let me do this in order. So Jeff asked about how I'm, if I'm disciplined or not, and I told you at the beginning about having daily habits. That's the one disciplined habit that I have. Is so we should we should try to keep you. No, you should stay. stay, stay don't go. Don't go. I feel, I feel lonely here now. Okay. Uh, oh God. Stay there. Stay, think, think what your own answer to the question is. If you've just tuned in, okay. we're having technical light yes. issues. Yes. Yes. Uh, see, I, I, being a writer is tough, so I can't afford to pay the rent here. So we're actually sort of, uh, anyway. So the discipline question, the primary discipline I have, if I know I'm working on a book, is I work on the book every day. I will sit down for as much time as I can work out, an hour, two hours, a half hour, and I will touch that manuscript or that document at least once a day. And if I don't feel like it, if I'm not motivated, if uh, whatever feelings are, I'll still sit there and stare at the document. And eventually I have enough self-loathing about the fact that I'm sitting there staring at a document that I write something. And it's usually not good, it's usually I hate writing, I hate writing, I hate writing. But then at some point I realize I am writing now, and I, oh, you know what, maybe I should write about this. And then 20 minutes later, I'm actually into it. And I'm not thinking about any more trying to get into it, I am just writing. So you literally write the words, I hate writing, if you, Sometimes, can't, if you can't come up with anything. And that is the PG-13 version of what I would write, oh, okay. yes. Uh, so I show up every day. And I, for me, that's my own habit. If I don't do it every day, I'm probably not going to do it. Every third day, Monday, Wednesday, Friday, I just don't do well for that. So that's the discipline thing. Uh, you also asked about tools. I am not a tool person. I'm a romantic about writing and that I think the hard part is what's in your 
in your brain. So I think I could write on pen and paper. I could write with a typewriter. I don't think it matters that much. I use Word just because I've always had Word, so I use it. If someone told me you can't use Word anymore and you have to use something else, I wouldn't care that much. I could use tech, a text editor. I don't, I don't think that stuff really matters much. There's no tool that's going to do the hard parts. So I don't, I don't, I try not to be um, obsessive about any of those tool things at all. So that's the first question. That was from Jeff. Uh, Jill had some good questions. Uh, Jill asked, is criticism different because the criticism that the book has gotten, I'm assuming that you mean reviews or uh, things people say under their breath perhaps, is criticism different because it's my story? And the answer, of course, is yes. But having written books before and published them and read the reviews, including the bad ones, I knew what I was getting into by publishing a book that was my story. I realized that uh, I was to write about yourself, whether it's fictional or not, when you write about yourself, you are now a character in a movie for people, regardless of whether it's true or not. When we go to the film and see a movie and then we leave and we go out to dinner or drinks with friends, we tear characters apart. We analyze them, we say they weren't believable, they, what they did was right, what they did was wrong, we become fodder for somebody else. And that's part of what comes along with publishing. It doesn't come along with writing, which is important in terms of figuring out yourself and figuring out your relationships. That writing never has that burden, that you should feel comfortable there because no one's gonna see it, it's for you. But once I knew I was going to publish this, um, I, I anticipated it. So some of the reviews, if you go on Amazon, some of the reviews uh, criticize me, uh, criticize me for writing the book, criticize the decisions that I made, and uh, I think that in a way they have every right to because I put it in a book and put it out into the world. I don't necessarily agree with those criticisms, but I anticipated it and I was prepared for it. And in the end, I feel I felt like this is the only way that we learn about family is by people writing about it and publishing it. Do you take them more personally? Because you, you, what you just described is kind of true for all your books, but for a memoir, does it does it get in more? I don't all? think uh, it probably does, but I'm not devastated by them. There's one review if you look on Amazon. Don't look for this review unless you've read the book because she gives away. Uh, some of the story, but that's very negative. She doesn't like the choices that she liked the book until certain choices that I made, and then she won't recommend the book to book to anyone because of that. And I don't agree with her, but I can understand. Okay, uh, for her that was a significant way to change the story. So um, I really, I, I'm I'm an author. I'm committed to writing the long term. I feel like there's probably other books I want to write where I am a character in them. So the sooner I learn how to deal with this, the better. And the only way to do that is to do it. Uh, this story and what's happened to my family, uh, it happened to me and I'm a writer. So an opportunity was in front of me as a creative person, as an artist, to make something about it and I chose to do it. And anytime you go to the movie theater or go to the art gallery or listen to music, you're hearing the same thing. Some, these are stories that have happened to the people who are creating them or stories that they know and that's what they're sharing with you. And, so I'm a believer in art in general. I'd like to make more books that are like this that explore universal themes and aren't purely about how to be better at public speaking or creative thinking or um, other things like that. All right. So that's a good segue into the next question, which is uh, how did I decide? Uh, okay. So, so Trina asked, who actually gave me some feedback on the book while it was being developed. So thank you for that, Trina. Um, how did I decide what to include? And she meant in terms of which family stories are you going to share, which ones you're not going to share. And when it comes to a memoir, especially about people who are, um, I just saw that my brother asked a question. That is awesome. By the way, my brother, who's a main character in the book, is tuning in. Hi, Todd. Hope you're doing well. Uh, how did I decide what to include? And that's really about drafting. That I knew in writing the book, I'd have multiple drafts, and for each draft, I would get a new opportunity to make those choices about what to include or not. So I had five people who read the drafts, and my brother was one of them. I depended on Todd to be a primary critic and a primary sanity checker, because for many of the stories, he was there. So he could challenge my memory of events 
and give another context to them. Maybe the facts were right, but the, what they meant was different. So my brother played a tremendous role in the book being written at all. I don't know what would have happened if I didn't have his support because then I would have felt even more isolated and alone and would have felt more, um, more concerned that I was being selfish and egotistical about telling the story at all, which we can talk about that more in a second. So I decided what to include over time. In every draft, I revised what stories were in and which ones weren't and how they were told. It revised. And the book probably had seven drafts, which is more than any other book that I've written. The last two or three drafts were very uh, minor, copy editing and refining, getting things really polished and tight. But that's still more drafts than any of the book that I have written. And she also, Trina also asked, did it happen? Did it help to know that my family would read the book? Um, my brother's involvement helped tremendously, like I said, because he, he and I have always been close. We're honest with each other. There's a lot of very important and painful stuff in the book. So him being involved made me feel much more comfortable with the likelihood that my mother or my father or even maybe my sister would eventually read the book that I felt like I represented, uh, I, I, that I was telling a fair version of the story. So I think that's it for um, the people, questions people asked earlier. Let me get to some of the questions you guys are posting in the list. Okay. Uh, but, but, but did you consider writing? Okay. Did I consider writing the book as fiction, even if mostly to avoid the issue of criticism of my decisions? Uh, I did, but not not really. I thought of it most often when I was struggling writing the drafts because I thought maybe I, I mentioned this book at the beginning, right? This Art of Time memoir book. There's a lot of structural issues you start writing into as the storyteller if you are in the story. And these are problems you deal with in fiction, but they're more pronounced in memoir. That's when I started to think maybe there'd be more room to, uh, to, to, to tell the story better or more honestly in a way if I could have more, more distance from the facts. But then I thought that the power of the book, if there's going to be any meaning in it for people, is that it, this is the Scott guy telling this story about his family. This is actually what I would tell you if we had dinner together and, or a few beers and I knew you well enough that I thought you cared about my story. This is what I would tell you. So why make it fiction? Why add a layer of doubt or room for, you know, is this, did, this, did this really happen or is this just storytelling? I didn't, I didn't want that. I thought that there's so many families that have so many problems and part of why there's so many families with so many problems is that everyone is afraid to talk about what's going on in their family. So with that as an ambition for the book, I didn't, it didn't make sense to me to fictionalize it. But um, I did think about it. It seems like it's a lot scarier, but then I realized, well, wait a second. Why am I writing a half scary book? I like the point. The point should be like either either you're all in, or you're, you're sort of like going like half therapy. I'm gonna go to, you know, or or even to go even further with that metaphor. I'm gonna go to I'm gonna go and see a therapist. But I'm gonna fictionalize what I am telling the therapist. Well, what's the point of that then? You're kind of betraying the whole idea of. Uh, on the honesty aspect of it for your readers too. It's very brave to, to put yourself out there in that way. It's I think it's brave to write a fictionalized version of your life too. Um, but but it's there's a bravery there that is good for other people to see. Too. Well, thank you, thank you. I hope that you guys who've read the book feel that way. Uh, hold on. I hope there's a way that I can edit out these little sections where I'm jumping up like like. Oh, okay. Sorry, I keep thinking. No worries. No, it's my burden, my book. <laughs> All right, so uh, let's get back to the list here. Uh, ah, yeah, someone asked about the book. Oh, by the way, I forgot to mention this. So I am going to write a blog post that sums up all the questions that you guys asked, including ones I don't get to, including all the books I've mentioned. I will write that up tonight. So if I went too fast or I skipped something or your Wi-Fi checked out or you got terrified when the lights went out, you're like, what happened? Check my blog tomorrow, this time by noon tomorrow. I'll have a write-up of everything, summarizing everything. So don't be worried or paranoid or angry at me if I forgot your question or I mumbled something and you couldn't hear what I was saying. Okay, uh, let's go back in here. Uh, ba, ba, ba. Did you come to have a different understanding of forgiveness as a human ability or 
valuable choice? That's a great question from Jill. My honest answer is I, I, don't, I don't know. I, I want to say that my understanding of relationships is much better. That doesn't mean that I am better in them, but my understanding of the many ways that they can function, the many healthy ways they function, the many unhealthy ways that they function, I feel like I understand all that much better. I understand my father much better. I'm not angry at him. I don't hate him. I think he's someone who has a lot of problems, a lot of issues, but I'm not angry at him for that. I just don't think it's healthy for me to have a relationship with him. That's a different thing. I think when I started to write the book, or certainly some of the stories, when I, some of the stories in the book where I'm trying to explain how I felt, I was a very angry person. I did have a lot of anger for him. There's a, pat, a part of the book where I talk about how much I hated him. It was one of the deepest feelings that I felt. And, and in writing the book, as much as I thought that I had worked through those things, writing the book and writing the book to make it suitable for publishing forced me to go through that again and again and again and again. And every time I learned something else or a different angle or something I was keeping secret from myself, a pet feeling that I kept in the corner that I wasn't dealing with. So um, I don't know that I answered your question. Unfortunately, it keeps moving. This is my issue on my end, but it keeps moving the questions around. Waffle iron, creative mind. You see where it went? Here. Da, 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 da. Uh, yeah. Okay. Can I add something? Yes, go for it. Yeah, yeah. One of the things, though, is that that um, you did a lot of work, and, and in the book you describe you uh, worked a lot on your relationship um, with your father. You also did a lot of thinking about your relationship um, outside of working with him about it. And so, so the the book writing was seems like uh, was a part of your overall. Uh, coming to forgiveness, coming to different places with the with your relationship with him. I think so, but that's part of my, um, I mentioned before that I, I keep, I've always kept a journal. There's something about the process of writing for me that's therapeutic. It doesn't mean that that justifies me as a professional, but there's always something I'm familiar with for processing stuff. And um, The forgiveness thing, I think, is a great question. I, I don't know that I can tell you confidently I'm a, I'm a better person now and I'm much more forgiving as a person. I don't know that I can claim that. I think I understand myself a lot better. I understand my family and the dynamics in which I grew up with way better. And some of that was simply purely for my brother, that everything that happened in our family drew us closer together. And then working on a book about it, where both of us had to sort through these memories and these feelings together, that also on its own had was a powerful thing and i think had i not published the book the fact writing the book and planning to publish it forced things to happen that were very helpful helpful to me you might not have gotten to that seventh draft no you know you might have written the earlier drafts which were a little angrier in tone perhaps as she can she read those early drafts read four of the seven yes <laughs> yeah so she read the early drafts that were a, a lot angrier at, at just about everybody so uh so if you thought the final version was angry and mean you should be grateful that she was involved in the early drafts because but I think that goes back to the what you talked about but memoir writing that the, the whether or not you're writing it from which perspective because you were really angry in the in the moments that 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 the stories are about and how do you stay true to that yes That's something that you worked on right? yes okay now the light that could be our timer for like when we have to switch questions yeah. that means you've been on the same question for too long Okay, we talk about fiction, uh, being such a creative mind. Oh, well, thank you. Creative, being such a creative mind and tackling so many topics in your blog, how do you decide on a topic or outline for a book? How do you handle book being already written, same old topic? So um, the same old topic thing is complete bullshit. It's complete bullshit. Uh, I wrote a blog post about this very topic called um, – I can't remember the name of it, but I will, it'll be in the blog. It'll be in the blog post tomorrow. Link to it. It's something like um, why it's okay, why it's okay to repeat yourself, or why it's okay to give common sense advice. I don't remember the exact title, but the basic notion is that unless you are Sophocles or Shakespeare or Aesop, 
unless you're those guys and you were writing stories 3,000 years ago, every kind of story has already been written somewhere. The fact that it, you're being novel is kind of a ridiculous idea. What you want to be is good. You want to write a good book, a good story, and you want to have it be interesting to the people who choose to read it. Now, I've read some Shakespeare. I haven't read all of Shakespeare. So the fact that Shakespeare, who knows, maybe one of Shakespeare's secret plays is actually about his relationship with his father. Maybe Hamlet is that for him, actually. It's an interesting question how much of Shakespeare's own life experience ended up in his plays. Did the fact that Shakespeare wrote Hamlet mean that I shouldn't have written The Ghost of My Father? Of course not. Of course not. A lot of people are never going to read Hamlet. They may know who Hamlet is, they're never going to read it. Some people may have an issue with their father, that their father is a distant relationship, and they'll be intrigued by the title of my book, and they'll read my book. Uh, that's it. Uh, so I don't worry too much about that. I worry more about being good. Am I doing good work? The fact that someone else has written a book on a topic is, is a ridiculous reason not to write something yourself. Because you're assuming that every person out there has read everything that exists already, which is not true. Okay, uh, what does a personal memoir need in order to be popular and have high sales? Well, I wish I knew. It's not about someone who's already in the public. Is it about someone who's already in the public eye? Does it need a character arc or a real realization or a profound truth? What makes it interesting to the reader? Well, those are, those are fantastic questions. Unfortunately, nobody knows the answers to those questions. Memoir is a really difficult thing to sell because people assume memoir means autobiography. And autobiography means comprehensive. So people often get bored about the notion of reading some person that they don't know of, they don't care about, about that person's life story. It's just not interesting. If Sting or Slash from Guns N' Roses or Keith Richards writes a memoir, well, wow, people know about their life already, and they know, okay, that's gonna be an interesting story. So memoir is loaded with a bunch of things that make it harder to sell. But I think that fundamentally you have the same issues that any other book does, which is the fact that a book is good has only a tangential relationship to how well it sells. Everyone's had the experience of going to the bestseller list and getting a book that sounds interesting and reading it and finding it awful. It's awful. You're like, how? What the? What happened here? As if it's some grand mystery that you... We like to believe the bestseller list is a meritocracy, but it's not. People who are famous, people who have more money to spend on marketing, people who write about something that happens to be in the news right now changes people's interest in that book, which generates sales. We've also had the opposite experience where we stumble on a book in a cabin on some, at some retreat, or we find it in a used bookstore, a book we've never heard of. It looks interesting. We start reading it, and it's amazing. It's an amazing book that never made a bestseller list, never won an award. Uh, so there's a lot of factors involved in making a living writing books or selling books that have nothing to do with the quality of the book itself. I think that uh, you're always trying to think about who your audience is. I, I, for this book, I'm thinking, well, people who want to read this are probably people who have issues with their father, or maybe they never had a father, or their father abandoned them, or they're children of divorces. Um, as a fun a group of people as all those people would be, uh, but that's who I think the audience is for this book. And when you're writing a memoir, it's useful to think that ask the same question. What kinds of people with what kinds of backgrounds and what kinds of stories are going to want to read a story like this one? That was also one of the reasons why I partnered with Big Brothers Big Sisters. Uh, profits from the book, from the first edition of, the, of this book, are being donated to them. The book explains my relationship with Big Brothers. My big brother Todd is a tremendous influence on me being... Uh, me being who I am, and if I didn't have him, I don't know who I would be. I volunteered at Big Brothers, and I figured they're an organization that has connections to the community of people that have estranged parents or difficult family dynamics. All right, let's move along here in the question list. If you have, okay, did, did you have any fears or concerns about how being this vulnerable, personal, and open would impact your perception? It would impact how I'm perceived and opportunities with my more business audience. Well, yeah. Um, every, I do a bunch of things. If any of you want to be career authors, I can tell you this advice, that it makes the most sense to write about one subject 
and to write about it again and again and again. That is the simplest way to build an audience. It's the simplest way to generate more sales. It also, the downside of it is that it, I think it's, it's boring or it's not as creative as taking on other kinds of work. So if you look at the careers of like John Grisham or uh, Tom Clancy or even like Malcolm Gladwell, they realize the kinds of books they found an audience for and they're going to keep writing them. And that's great. That's hard enough. But I am one of the things that's wrong with my brain or my ambitions in life. I want to write about everything. I want to write about different things. And I have to do that at some point. So this was an opportunity to, what happens if I go off the map? That it's not just about this kind of business thinking or this kind of creativity thinking. It's actually just a memoir. What happens? I know I want to write novels, so this is a stepping stone to that. So to answer Joe's question though, of course, uh, definitely have fears about it, but I can't let that fear stop me from following on the ambitious path that I'm trying to follow. I also feel like the worst thing that'll happen to me is no one will read the book. Oh, okay, I spent a year and a half writing this book, whatever it is, people don't like it, it gets lousy reviews, they won't buy it. Okay, I'll write the next book then. And then when you see I'm having trouble paying the rent here to keep the power on, so the next book is probably gonna have to be like a management, creative thinking book. But I figure I can always go back, and that's really my plan as much as I can figure it out, is to try to switch back and forth between books that are more mainstream or more in line with my previous books and books that take bigger risks. I give a lot of advice to people about creative thinking. I feel obligated giving that advice that I have to practice it myself and to do work that is challenging and risky. So that's my answer to that. Uh, I didn't see an answer to this one. This is from my brother. He's such a smart, tricky guy. More smart than tricky. He's asking me, I don't see this being asked. Simple question, why did you write the book? And maybe for part two, what did you want to get out of it? Well, I wrote the book for many reasons. I think that while all this was happening to our family, I was on the phone with my, with my mother, I was on the phone with my brother, right at the point at which my father had this, this affair late in his life. We were all, I was on the phone with him talking to him all the time. We're all dealing with a crisis, a, a family crisis and a personal crisis. And it came up in my mind, and I talked to both of them about it. I'm like, this should be a book. This is a crazy story. This is an, a ridiculous story. And it's strange in that way that you would never believe. If this was in a movie, you wouldn't quite believe that this could actually happen. And so as I'm, and I mentioned it to my brother, I mentioned it to my mother, and they're both like, yeah, this, this, is, this would be like a lifetime movie drama. So I'm like, well, I'm a writer, right? Um, you know, I'm the only one in the family who has the time and inclination to do this, so maybe I should be a book. And as it, the way it is with creative projects, once you have the idea, the next test is you start writing about it. So I started keeping a journal. And as I developed the journal, I, I, getting back to therapeutic reasons for journals, uh, I found it helpful and useful, but I also found that I thought there were universal truths in the story of the Birkin family that anyone who is in a family and in a relationship, there are truths there that if I did a good job writing about it, could be helpful to somebody else. And I feel like that's my job. As a writer, that is my job, to try to find truths in the world, uh, whether it's in a business context or emotional or whatever it is. My job is to find those truths and to learn those things and to, <laughs> and, this is like a juggling act or something, and to bring those truths and to share them with other people. That's what a writer does. So, um, and then as my brother got involved and read the drafts, I continued to feel this is the right thing for me to do. Um, was, it, was it the right thing to do? So part two of his question yeah. is, what did you want to get out of it? What did I want to get out of it? I think that, I, there's a bunch of things that I wanted. I wanted for my brother's kids and my sister's kids, I wanted there to be some record of what had happened. That so much of what happens in families gets talked about and we, we like to pretend that our memories are reliable and they're not. Every time we remember a story or a thing, we change it a little bit. We emphasize certain parts and we diminish others. 
I want there to be a record of what happened. Even though my brother's kids and my sister's kids, they may not directly be affected by what happened, but there are indirect consequences of what happened. When families are estranged and people leave and there's pain and there's these echoing, this, it reverberates through family. Uh, I think that what happened to me was an echoing of what my grandfather did to my father and probably what my great-grandfather did to my grandfather. I'm going to get lost in that tree somewhere. So I wanted there to be, I'm a writer, this is something I can do for my family, which sounds like an arrogant thing to do, and it might be, but I didn't see anyone else who could do it. I wanted to do the equivalent of a photo album for the story of my family. That was one. Uh, two was, I mentioned before, I'm, I'm a creative, I want to be a creative writer. I want to take on projects that challenge me and that are more ambitious and that take on bigger questions. Bigger questions than how to be a better manager or how to be a good public speaker. And this was an opportunity that I was in the middle of, so I wanted to see if I could do that. And then there's probably, there's probably other ones, but those, those, those two were enough for me to say this should be the next book and see if I can, see if I can make it work. Okay, I'm going to come back here to the, uh, okay, were there periods of doubt, this is from David, hi David, were there periods of doubt where writing this book, with writing this book, that were more severe or different than what you have experienced before, were your habits always strong enough to alleviate those doubts? If not, what parts of your life help you rebound? Uh, okay. Um, let me read it again, just so I can. I think that writing, writing memoir or writing fiction, the expectations people have of the writing are higher. And there, you can't rely on the how, how the way that you have to write is different. And that's part of why I ended up with more drafts is in reading the, the, for the other books, I work really hard on them, but the third draft, I feel like this is, this is, this is, this is it. Whatever it's going to be, it, it is here now. And there's no parts of it as I am reading it. Whenever I do a draft, I do what I call the big read. If I think I'm done with the draft, I take a few days, I, do, I don't work on the book, but then I start at the beginning of the book and I read through the whole thing. I want to experience the book as a reader is going to experience it. And if the draft's in good shape, I should be able to get through most of it without wanting to throw it at the wall, or without calling bullshit on myself. That's, like the, that's, the, that's the test. That's the, the, one of the best, best habits I think I have. I hate to do it. It's not fun, but I do it. For this book, the fourth draft, I'd still hit pockets and I was like, this just doesn't work. Like I'm jumping from this to that, or I don't, I'm writing about this in a way, I don't believe, I, I wrote it, I don't believe that. This doesn't seem right to me. So if it doesn't seem right to me, I wrote it. And you lived it. And I lived it. So uh, I think it just took more, now a more experienced fiction writer, a more experienced memoirist, maybe they wouldn't have needed as many drafts, but I felt that it did. And the next time I write a book like this, Maybe, maybe that's just, for me, it takes that many revisions to get, and some of you maybe may have read the book and be like, Scott, could have used two more? Like, there's no way to be certain that um, it's very subjective when you're in more creative kinds of writing about what is finished and what is done and what's a well-told story and what's meaningful and what's bullshit and what's authenticity. Those are all become very, very subjective. So there definitely were periods of doubt. That's part of also why... Um, the people reading the drafts help a ton because they are not in my head and picking those people is something you have to do very carefully because you want people who are care enough about you that they'll put in a time. It's hard to read drafts. They're unfinished. They're sloppy. Uh, my brother had to read the early drafts, which had a lot of stuff about him in them, which is probably hard for him to do. Um, but now I've lost my train of thoughts. So we're going to when use the light. We're going to switch to the next question. So periods of doubt, yes, there definitely were. How do you deal with the situations you don't remember precisely, e.g., the names of places, people, what happened exactly, what people said? Well, um, the art of time and memoir book talks about this a little bit. Um, there's another book I read that talked about this. Um, so I will include a better answer to this in the blog post. There's a wide spectrum of latitude or perceived latitude that people have in the, in the writing world, literary world, about how factually accurate does a memoir need to be. 
There's different theories about this. Uh, one theory is that if you literally s describe things exactly as they happened, because for the reader they're not actually happening, they don't have the same power as if you were writing about them dramatically, and that there is some license, poetic license, for a writer to shift the focus or amplify things. And is that lying? Is that deception? Is it, it gets complicated as to where you draw the line. But my approach to this was, I'm going to talk to you, I'm going to write it as if I'm talking to someone who I know well and trust about what happened. Uh, my brother's involvement helped a ton with facts. I'd kept a journal myself throughout this entire two-year period in my family's life. So I had my own documentation of who I talked to, what, what we talk about. It's not, it wasn't like police, it wasn't super precise, but it was precise enough. And um, I also had the section at the beginning where I talk about memory. And I made clear to the reader, like, this whole notion of memory is kind of um, a kludgy thing. So I'm writing the book from what I remember, but if someone told me, Scott, I was there and I was recording the conversation, it's not what you said, I would probably say you're probably right. This is the best, most authentic version of the story that I can tell. And there's a little footnote, no one reads the thing on the first page where it says like the licensing and publication date. I have a little disclaimer in there about facts. I figured that was a nice place to slip it in. So if you're curious about what the disclaimer says, you, you should go read it. I think, I think there's a joke or two in there. Um, that's actually a question that hasn't come up about uh, humor and why the book is not funny at all. I hope I've been entertaining for you so far, that at least the two of us together have been entertaining. Have you been entertained? I've been entertained. By the lights. The lights I know, I know. Uh, let's see if there's another question here uh, that I missed. Ah, you know what? I have another question for you, Miss Longacre. Did I miss one? Yeah. I think that we've got to all these. Yeah. The way you guys can't see this, but the way it shows me the questions is actually kind of confusing. They're not organized. I'm not sure if they're organized by time or not, so I may have missed something. Uh, oh, here's a question I missed. Uh, uh, I just, David, that's funny. I am like Batman. I keep leaving the room. Good thing I come back as not a different person, though. What, is, is it, what, what are your thoughts? Do you think it's safe to use composite characters when writing memoirs, or is that too inauthentic um, for, for practical reasons, e.g. legal fears? Well, the, the legal stuff around this is, uh, there's a lot of latitude there. If you're writing about your story about what happened and when, and you're not, it's, it's kind of hard for someone to win a lawsuit that your memory of relationship is a certain way. Especially if you're focused on your feelings about the relationship, your feelings about your decisions, what the story of what happened meant to you. It's very hard for someone to win a lawsuit, but they can sue you. But to win lawsuits about defamation of character and all these things you see in movies is actually really hard. Most people who have fears about this stuff, I tell them, have you written the draft yet? And 95% of the time they say no. And I say, if that's what's holding you up from writing a draft, then your fear is bullshit. This is a thing you're, you're pretending you need to figure out before you can write a draft. And as Vanessa explained, writing about your story for yourself is valuable on its own. And you can write a draft not being sure, is this going to be a memoir? Is this going to be a novel? Is this going to be something I'm just writing for myself? You don't have to decide that. That's a decision you can have, you can make over a bottle of wine when your draft is done and you can read it, do the big read yourself and decide then. But if you're hung up on that, I call, I call BS on that. And there's a lot of these things people, people get hung up on. This tiny little technicality. And they, oh, well, I haven't figured that out yet, so I'm not going to, speaking of technicalities, I am not going to, uh... <laughs> wouldn't it be funny if there was like someone in the other room just flipping the switch? <laughs> it's not actually an automated room thing. Anyway, so that's my answer to that. A lot of these questions people ask me, after they ask me two of them, I'm like, have you written anything yet? They go, no, no, I'm trying to figure out this uh, fiction or nonfiction thing first. And I, I just shake my head. I'm like, that's, that's a cop out. And Writing or making a movie or starting a company is filled with these little details that it's easy to get hung up on and allow yourself to convince yourself that that's a justifiable reason for not doing it. And it's not. And it's not. Let's see. Concern about, okay, I missed this one too from Jen. Hi, Jen. Jen was actually very helpful 
in uh, the book's release. So Jen, it's, I'm glad that you're here. I'm sorry I didn't miss your question. Was there a concern about backlash, guilt, manipulation, and shame from those in the story that weren't portrayed in the best light? Well, uh, yes. But, um, and that's still something I am sorting out and dealing with. Um, in the case of, case of my sister, she left the family. I don't want to give away too much of the plot of the plot. That's the wrong word. Too much of the story. It's a true story. Uh, she left the family. I felt that that, without explanation, you have to read the book to get into the details of what happened, or at least my, my, my perception of what happened and why. But I felt that gave me license to tell my point of view, at least on her part of the story. She's gone without a reason. Uh, is that right? Is that wrong? I don't think there's a, there's a definitive answer to that. I thought that I had to tell the story again in part because of the next generation. I may be totally messed up, ir irrecoverable. You know parts of me that are like, there may be things that I, it's too late to, to, for me to fix. Uh, maybe true for my brother too. I don't believe that, but let's just assume maybe. For the next generation of Birkins, for the next generation, they don't deserve any of this stuff. They didn't, they didn't, they weren't around for this. So the notion that they could get affected by things I did or my father did or didn't do really upsets me and bothers me. And so if I, and this is, this is a, a self, maybe a selfish trade, if I end up having to deal with more challenges in my relationships in, inside the family, but by doing that, it minimizes what happens for the next generation, that's a trade I am comfortable making. All these questions, is that the right thing to do? Is it my position to do that? I don't know. Uh, I decided that it was, so I did it. Um, my relationship with my mother is more complicated now. I don't talk to my father. Uh, my brother mostly doesn't talk to him either. Um, I wish him well. I wish my mother well. I don't think things are going to change very much, but um, this is par for the course. I knew that I... I knew that I'd be on this side of it, and for the most part, I have been really pleased with how many people who have read the book have told me that it helped them ask questions about their family, even if nothing like what happened to my family happened to theirs, and that it's a story that stuck with them. And they don't know what they'll do with it yet, but it's a story that they have a reference point for a family that, a family that uh, tore itself apart. So. Uh, on to other questions. Let's see if we have other fun ones in here. Uh, do you have any discomfort going to read the older email correspondence with your dad? Thought their inclusion was a powerful part of this memoir that made it unique. Well, thank you, David. I haven't looked at the book in a while, so I don't know how I would feel if I sat down to look at it today. I remember while writing it, and I think this comes up in the book, that... There's lots of things while writing the book I had forgotten about. And I'd be like, wow, did that really happen? And Todd and I, my brother, would talk, like, did that really happen? That we needed a sanity check with each other about some of these events and some of these things and some of the correspondence and stuff. So um, I definitely had discomfort reading it. And, um, and I guess I still do because I'm pausing and thinking about it. There's troubling things, but I think there's troubling things in lots of family relationships. And I'm glad that you thought including it was beneficial. I think that's part of the mystery of family, that we only get to be inside one family. I mean, maybe two. We marry into one. But there's all the stuff that happens that we have our friends talk about. And it's in the abstract. To, have, to be inside the story was what I think a good memoir should do. And that was one way, one way to do it. Okay, we have two minutes left, so uh, I will look to see if there's any last questions. I don't think that there are, so I'll just remind you, I thank you all for tuning in. There's about 20, 20 plus of you now. Thank you for spending your lunch or tea break uh, listening to me talk about the book. Uh, if you haven't read the book, there's a free chapter you can grab. It's on my website. If you have read the book and you haven't written a review, please do that. Someone mentioned about sales before. Uh, the simplest thing that anyone who's read the book can do, even if you didn't like it, is to put some note, some note out to the world that you read it. That's a signifier in some way that the book even exists, and uh, it's also a way for me to learn. I read all the I read all the reviews, 
And I will post tomorrow at noon a list of all these questions with my answers, links to the books that I mentioned, so you don't have to take a screenshot of this one uh, or this one. But if you're anal retentive and you want to grab them now, you just saw them again. And uh, um, let's see. Last call for questions. Let's see. Do, do, do. No, no, we answered that one. Waffle iron, we talked about that. Different understanding. Do you have anything over there? Well, the only thing I was thinking about the last question was the um, the repercussions for yes. writing it. I think that from a therapeutic standpoint, we talked a little bit about uh, writing is good, right? You know, but whether what making the decision to publish or not, and really thinking about if you are thinking about doing that, thinking through what it is you're hoping for, um, and hmm. then we talked a little bit about you and I have talked a little bit about that. that, that um, Ah. If you might not have, uh, you might think you have, the goal is you, you don't care what anybody thinks and, and you just want to get it out there, but to really, when you're making that decision, to really um, explore that and to, you know, like think through what, what is, what's the sneaky part of me secretly hoping if my family reads this, they're going to do X, Y, and Z, you know, so they, whether or not you, whether or not you, writing really gives you a place to explore your feelings is great, but like what you are secretly hoping publishing will do for you is I think a hook that would be good to know before it's read by millions of people because you're all fabulous authors um, instead of ahead of time. So really thinking through what your goals are. And, it, and then if you want, if you're hoping that publishing something will fix your family, that you think through whether or not, that, you know, they, you get clear on what what is possible and what is and what's practical and what might backfire and those kinds of things. That is uh, fantastic. Uh, we were talking before we had an email exchange about this whole session and what we would talk about and um, uh, how it would go. And she had a thing she mentioned about the reason you think you want to write a memoir and the secret the secret reason. And for most people, I think the secret reason is oh, like this. Once, once my insert my father, mother, brother, sister, child. Once they read this, now they'll know. This will this will fix. When they, the, the, and this will this will this will this will do the thing I couldn't do. And um, my early drafts probably reflected that, where I believed that if I told the story in a certain way, it would actually change something in the family. And it really hasn't. I didn't think that it would. I think if you read the book. Uh, some of that self-reflection there. It changed me, but that's a different secret wish, and that secret wish doesn't require publishing the book to to achieve. Uh, and this isn't to dissuade anybody from publishing a memoir. It's just really, I mean, for your own like mental health, you know, knowing what you're hoping to get out of it. And it can be sneaky and tricky, and you might not get all the all the things out there you know ahead of time. But something to explore if you're thinking about it. Yeah, that's uh, that's really good advice. I think. Uh, oh, hold on. <laughs> We're out of time. We are out of time. I just want to. Say, I want to say one last thing about this because I think it's the most important reason that people are interested in memoir. They think that there's some other thing that's going to enable that. Uh, but the question to ask is, why is there something in a book that you haven't already told your husband, your mother, your sister, your brother? Uh, why haven't they heard you? Um, Maybe there's a different way you need to express yourself to them, or maybe there's something that you're not seeing about what it is you're trying to tell them. And, um, and also the other thing that I keep thinking about is that there's also a level of grief. Like when you talk about estrangement, that there's a, a lo level of grief in, in that, that that a lot of people process through writing. And um, so if you have, if you are processing grief and you have a secret hope that there will be an outcome, that, that's sort of setting you yourself up in some way too. So. Okay, it's now 1.03. Uh, thank you guys again for tuning in. Check the blog tomorrow at noon PST time. I'll write up a summary. And if you have other questions, you're free to leave them in the comments of that post and I'll answer those questions too. So thanks for tuning in guys. I hope you got uh, your money's worth, although it's free. So it should, should have been easy to do. But have a good day, and check out the post tomorrow. Bye. Bye.